You know, for years I wondered who was putting McLean's magazine in front of Time in the Canadian airports, now I know. <laughs> you know, I've been back at Time Inc. for two years now to take the company public. And coming back to the industry after a 14-year absence, I realized there's an awful lot of things that have changed. And the challenges that we all face seem insurmountable, or they can seem quite exciting. I take the position we are in the most exciting time for opportunity for content producers in the history of media. Things are changing all over the place, and they're changing so rapidly. And the opportunity for all of us is to say, how are we going to play in the new world? You know, when I came back to Time Inc., someone told me that Henry Luce wouldn't have done that. And I said, I've got two comments. First of all, the guy's dead. <laughs> Second of all, Henry Luce built the greatest company on the face of the earth by not worrying about what Henry Luce would have done. He looked forward and seized the opportunity in front of him and didn't cry about what it was like in the past when Henry Luce ran it. And the opportunity for all of us is to look forward through this dislocation, to look forward through this time of incredible change and say, how are we going to play and how are we all going to be successful in the future? Because I know we have that great opportunity. We have at Time Inc. one of the most powerful portfolio of brands, of media brands you know and trust. Some of our brands have been around for over 146 years. But we have world-renowned brands. And one of the reasons I came back to Time Inc., I had been in the world of private equity, I realized brands and content and great content producers are an incredible valuable asset going forward because there's so much bad content out there. And for content producers like Time Inc., it's an exciting opportunity. Each and every day we have cultural moments that create people to stop, to take their break from scanning, from engaging with content and marketing messages. In fact, one of the problems we have today is attention span. People are not engaging as often as they do. They do engage with our content. Our journalism and our creativity, our narration through the written word, and our imagery, our powerful experiences are the center of everything we do at Time, Inc., and that will not change. Time, Inc. has always been a great journalistic institution. We've always been noted for the quality of our content, and I believe in this fractured media world, quality content counts, and quality content will always prevail. We do engage passionate audiences of scale. We do have 120 million print monthlies. I'm very proud to say that our digital audiences since I've been back now surpass our print audiences at 155 million. We have over 600 annual events that we produce. In fact, the largest event we produce is the Essence Music Festival in New Orleans, where for the 4th of July weekend in the United States, 550,000 people show up. And we're investing heavily in events because we think that events are an important component of content experiences, social outreach, and advertisers love to participate there. We've also gotten very good at social. We have 168 million social followings, and we have 150 million people in our database, and data is going to be an important component of how we operate into the future. But this is an industry in transition. There's no doubt about it. In fact, global media resides in a very unpredictable world. You know, I started my career when we all had five channels, then we went to 500 channels, and now we're going to 550,000 channels, and that's not going to change. The way the millennials are absorbing content, the way they're engaging with content, it's vastly different. There are more content messages coming at people right now than ever before in history, and media in the rate of change is very, very high rate of change, and the difference in gross margin between the top producers and the lowest producers is pretty enormous. Those who get it right do well, and those who don't get it right have margin problems. And that is happening in our industry right now. Before, when I first started in the industry, we were very predictable, very low rate of change, everything was pretty steady, solid cash flows. All you had to do is produce more magazines, and the cash came running in. Those days are over. We've got to be a lot more innovative. You know, there are 7.2 billion people on the planet right now. And 6.1 billion have cell phones, and over 4.5 billion have running toilets. So the move to mobile is really transforming the way we all interact with content. And the move to mobile is changing the way we're all interacting with advertising messages. But that change is pretty dramatic. And that device is not a great device for delivery of advertising messages. So a lot of conversation going on about what does that new world look like when all advertising is delivered over those devices. It's not a great device for that. The average mobile phone user checks their phone 100 times per day. When she used to go through the supermarket, mom used to pick up our magazines and flip through them. Now she's texting her kids. 
You go on the airplane, you used to get five magazines for the long trip, now you have your cell phone, you have email, you have your laptop, you can interact because digital is there. So the distraction, the digital distraction for the content we produce in printed form is there, but it is always available to us in the mobile format and we've got to embrace that. The attention spans have dropped. In fact, the average attention span have dropped from 12 seconds in 2000 to eight seconds in 2013. That's one second less than a goldfish. So when we're trying to reach our audiences, just think of that beautiful goldfish in this picture. That's who you're trying to reach. Attention spans have dropped and the challenge for all of us content producers, how do we break through? But there's a crowded marketplace. The noise that we're all receiving, the amount of messages received, the availability of content is enormous. The forms of distribution are enormous. We as a group in the history of man have never been given more advertising messages than we are today. We've never been given more media options than we have today. We've never been able to gather and chat about things than we have today. The, the crowd is enormous. The spam is enormous. The distractions are enormous. And it's up to all of us to break through that clutter and I believe quality content breaks through. So let me talk about our transformation strategy and what we're doing at Time Inc. Our strategic framework recognizes that media companies, we all now reside in a very unpredictable world. The old good days when you could launch a magazine, have a real sense of what it would do, those days were over. It's very unpredictable going forward. There's continuous turbulence, disruption and change, and there is no one silver bullet. When I came back to Time Inc., people said to me, what's the one thing you're going to do? And I said, we're going to do everything better. We're going to do everything smarter. We're going to pursue our audiences wherever they are, because there is no one silver bullet. And Timing's transformation strategy is to enhance our core business. Our core products are, are well-defined leaders, and we're committing to continue reviewing and challenging our practices and approaches. In short, I believe people are going to read magazines for the next 30 years. They're not going anywhere. They're just slowly shrinking. Time Inc. has been shrinking its magazine business about 4 or 5% a year for the last seven years. We're forecasting that trend to continue in print magazines because we must. Although I believe it will level off, I think as an organization we need to continue to predict that so we look at new products and services. We're extending our brands, our content, and our audiences. We believe we super serve passions and in a world where people are migrating to 50,000 channels, migrating to their passions, we believe the opportunity for us is to give our passionate audiences even more content than what they're looking for, even more ways to interact with us, even more ways to do things with our content than they have before. You know, in my speeches to Wall Street, they said, who's ever done that before? And I've used the example, there are some people here from National Geographic, I've used them as an example. They went from a sleepy old magazine publisher to a multimedia powerhouse with their deal with Fox, with their games, with their stores, with trips with their photographers. In short, they've super served their passionate audiences, giving them more things of what they're looking for, and that's what we need to do. There's no lack of interest in what we cover. There's no lack of interest in what we talk about. There's simply a lack of interest in paper products but there's no lack of interest in what we're doing. And there's still plenty of interest in paper products, it's just not as strong as it was before. We're also investing in growing profitably and that re requires intelligent risk taking. Being an independent corporation means we get to keep the four to five hundred million dollars of cash flow we make each year and invest that back in our business. That is for the first time for Time Inc. a new opportunity for us to invest in our business and grow it. And we want to empower our teams to win in short, I need to create the vehicles for my organization to be successful. Make sure they have the tools, the resources, and the experience, and the enthusiasm to move forward. We promote and support a collaborative work environment where people can work together to succeed. In fact, when we move our offices downtown at the end of this month, we're going from 1,642 separate offices at the Time Inc. building at 6th Avenue and 50th Street. When we go downtown, there'll be 102 offices downtown. We're going to a completely open collaborative environment. We're also looking at revenue transformation and advertising. We've reinvented our Coral Central sales teams, selling the collective strength of Time Inc., selling our audiences. We're elevating our conversations with the CMO level. I'm leaving this conference and going down to the ANA in Orlando, where virtually every CMO in America is gathering to spend lots of time with them talking about how can Time Inc. help you be more successful. You know, the average CMO has a shelf life right now of about a year and a half, shorter than a CEO because a lot of what they're doing isn't working. A lot of the digital advertising they're doing isn't working. It's not selling products and services and brand values are decreasing because customers are not engaging with those digital products like they engage with our products. So there's real opportunity for us. 
We're also looking at native and custom. Native advertising is, meant, is supposed to be growing to a $28 billion business in the next couple of years. So we're investing very, very, heavily, very heavily in that. We just started a group called The Foundry, which will be housed in Brooklyn, that will create native, native advertising programs for our advertisers, bring custom solutions to our advertising partners, like The Drive, a new uh, website that we've created for automobile content. And we're collaborating with our, with our editorial colleagues to integrate marketing solutions into everything we do with our brand portfolio. Portfolio. We're also working in programmatic. Programmatic is growing very nicely for us. Not only is the revenue higher, but the rates that we're charging for it are higher. We're selling ourselves as the premium programmatic network because more and more advertisers are buying programmatic and we need to be there. We also one of the first to offer print programmatic and we're finding digital buyers buying print advertising because they're suddenly realizing that print advertising on an audience basis is just as expensive as digital advertising on an audience basis and that's going very well for us. And we're also working very hard to build our digital audience with our content strategy, making sure we're producing more and more content, growing our digital audiences dramatically. When I came back to the company, people was number nine in the digital audience, in the human interest and celebrity category, and in nine months, we're back to number one. So focusing on doing the things that we needed to do for so many years of growing those digital audiences, and we're building those very, very profitably for us, and we're very excited about that. On the consumer marketing side, we have a large data initiative. In fact, data is going to be the center of everything we do. Uh, data is an important component of what we do. We'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. We also have a paid content strategy. We're testing paywalls uh, across our brands, saying what are consumers willing to pay for? What are they willing to do for free? How much do we pay? How much do we give them for free? And how much do we charge for? And we're working on that right now. We're looking at pricing models. You know, magazines are one of the few things that are sold across the United States, across the world, at the same price. So throughout, whether if you're in New York City, if you're in rural Alabama, People Magazine is charged the same price in both places. We're testing different pricing arrangements to see what we can do to drive volume by using price as a lever. And so far, we've got some pretty good uh, results from that. We're also looking at mobile. We're the, one of the launch partners for Apple's iOS 9 news app. Uh, we're working with Next Issue Media, the No Rogers and others, many of you participate in. And we think it could really improve the performance of our circulation revenues. So mobile is an important component for us. Video is also an important component for us for mobile because we know that video is a really great uh, experience on a mobile device. Uh, this year we'll produce about 9,000 individual videos. We are now working with our editors to produce videos for their, uh, what they do every day. In fact, what our editors do every day is quite exciting to our customers and we're asking them to just produce videos, raw videos on your iPhone talking about the things you've done. You know, when we had Donald Trump on the cover when he had that bald eagle on his arm, uh, there was really funny stories behind that eagle flapping around, messing his hair, and all the things that went on. And Nancy Gibbs told that story on Morning Joe. Going forward, she's going to tell us on our video, on our websites, talking about the things that went on. In fact, we just had InStyle attend a fashion show, and on the way back, they called it the taxicab videos. Our editors pulled out their iPhone and recorded their impressions of the fashion show they saw, and that went online on our websites and was uh, read by and looked by uh, hundreds of thousands of people. It was very successful for us. So video and raw video, the intimacy of the editorial process is going to be an important component of how we'll work with on mobile going forward. We're also investing heavily in data. I've just hired Dr. J.T. Kosman, who comes to me from Samsung and the CIA. Uh, I have a database that tracks 150 million U.S. adults, and we are working with senior brand leaders, senior CMOs around the United States, saying, how can we use our targeting capabilities? How can we use our data to help you be more effective? How can we make sure that your message breaks through the clutter? Because that's the problem CMOs are having. How do I break through the clutter of what's become advertising messages today and I believe that re really revolves around having superior content, having engaging content, and then giving back to the CMOs the, the information and the data they're used to getting from digital sources to help them understand why print and our content is really effective in driving their messages through. So our revenue transformations, I talked about video and television. We're also uh, looking at adjacencies. One of those is Sports Illustrated Play. We just bought up about 40% of the market for digitization of sports uh, scoring and team organization in the United States for youth sports. That will be uh, orchestrated under a new product called Sports Illustrated Play. It will give us access to all the youth sports in the United States. We have Sports Illustrated for kids. We'll probably rename SI Play, and we're going to be working very extensively getting at kids doing that. We've also invested in live events. We've had about 450 live events that are very successful and highly profitable for us. 
We just bought a company called Invent, which has about 250 of their own. So now we're working with our advertising partners saying we can work with you on mobile, we can work with you on digital, we can work with you on print, and we can also work with you on creating events that create the social outreach that you're looking for. In short, multi-platform experiences that help you engage your audiences in ways that you can't with anyone else. We're also looking at new products and services, style networks. You'll see us selling some things before that we didn't. You know, in the UK, we just got involved in a, a sportive company that we just purchased. We just bought a company that, that focuses on the digital registration for equine events. We have one of the largest horse magazines in the UK, Horse and Hound. And that equine event acquisition, the registration system, will give us the data that's required to help our advertisers understand who their customers are and will help us understand a lot more about those people involved in equine. So I also want to talk a few thoughts about culture. Because I had a breakfast this morning and someone said to me, is cultural change important? You know, we are an industry of transition. There's a lot going on around us. The world is changing. People are not watching television as they, as they much before. People are looking at things online. They're multitasking. They're looking at their cell phones. That's why the media stocks in the last couple of months have been down 30 to 40% in the United States. There's so much change going on. And when you come back to an organization like Time Inc. like I did, I left it 14 years earlier, and I came back to it and said, how do you make this corporation change? I have the good fortune of knowing Lou Gerstner from IBM. Many of you know he transformed that organization. He went from the cookie man, he was the cookie guy from Nabisco, and went to the IBM Corporation, one of the most successful turnarounds in history. We had the opportunity to talk to Malali, who ran Ford one of the most successful turnarounds in history. In fact, the only US automobile manufacturer that didn't need a federal bailout. And both of them told me the most important thing they focused on was culture. Lou Gerstner will tell you culture trumps strategy every day of the week. And what culture means is getting our entire organization not to be fearful of the changes we face, not to be fearful of the headwinds that are in front of us, but to be excited about the changes and the opportunities it presents because the old models are changing. And culture trumps strategy every time. If I get the 8,000 people that work for Time Inc. to be excited about our future, to be excited about where we're going, to be excited about new ideas, then Time Inc. will do just well. We launched One Time Inc. It's a program about bringing us together to compete as one company. It's about buying into the mindset of collaboration across the organization. In short, it's about tapping into the great genius of 8,000 people and saying, what can we do better? You know, I formed a group very early on in the organization that called them the new, the new Media Upstarts. There's 500 of very young people in the company that gather frequently to talk about what we can do differently, to talk about Time Inc., to talk about the media industry. And the great part about them is they don't know why it won't work. Their enthusiasm is infectious. Their inexperience is also, caught. you have to be very cautious about it. But they don't know why it won't work like all of we do. They're not jaded like we are by the changes that are facing us. We like the way it was before when everything was so profitable. They're very excited about our opportunities. They're very excited about where we can go. And in any organization of change, finding the way to tap into that organization, to tap into that mindset in your organization, the excitement about what the opportunity presents itself, that's how you go for transformation. And that's what we're doing at Time Inc. We are an organization that was seriously underinvested in for 10 years. We had no investment from Time Warner. They took the money and invested it elsewhere. And in the first six months of this year, we've invested more in Time Inc. than Time Warner did in the last 10. So the opportunity for investment is there. The opportunity for growth is there. We have these incredible brands. And the question for my organization is, so what are we going to do with it? How are we going to play into the future? Our vision is to become the world's most influential media network by igniting and elevating and fulfilling its passions. We super serve over 98 different passions with our magazines, whether it be equine, southern cooking, celebrity, entertainment, news, sports, you name it, we cover it. And we want to super serve those passions, give them more and more ways to interact with Time Inc., more and more ways to interact with our content, with our products and services to make them really engage with us. Our, until our separation, we were defined as the magazine division of Time Warner. In fact, I've often said one of the most destructive labels we gave ourselves was the magazine division because we defined ourselves by our distribution vehicle. When I got the job, the Wall Street Journal reporter called me up that day and he said, what's going to be different about your rule? And I said, we're no longer a magazine company. We're the world's premier content company. Because defining yourself by your distribution vehicle makes you miss so many opportunities for alternative forms of distribution. 
because paper will be declining. There's no doubt about that. We have to admit that. Go to any airport. Our magazine racks are shrinking. Go to any supermarket. Our magazine racks are shrinking. Look at any of your subscriptions. Look at any of your newsstand sales. They're shrinking. There is no lack of interest in what we produce, high quality, incredible content. The experiences that we produce, the way we go about our content, there are more and more people thirsty for the content we produce, just not as much on print before. So by calling ourselves the magazine division, we limited ourselves to just print. We didn't think of ourselves as a full-fledged content company with the license and the ability to reach consumers all over the place, and we're doing that. The broader identity allowed us to reinvent ourselves. So before I open it up, for if you have any questions, I just want to say, for the first time in 10 years, Time Inc. is open for business. We understand this is a changing economy. We understand that all of you in all of your countries are facing lots of changes. But Time Inc. is a, one of the largest publishers, the largest publisher in the United States, the largest publisher in the UK. And we're open for partnerships, for engagement, for thinking of lots of different ways to tap into the wonderful assets that we have, that you have, our, whether it be our content, whether it be our audiences, whether it be our access, to really get excited and seize the opportunities that this industry has. And as we all sit here at this conference and talk about where we're going, you can, as the first speaker said, you can sit here and say, oh my God, it's frightening out there, it's changing. Or you can say, oh my God, it's changing. There are new opportunities. How can we play as an industry? How can we play as the premier content producers in the world to seize the incredible opportunities that are in front of us. That's what we're going to do at Time Inc. And I hope all of you join us and come along. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? Thank you, Joe. You will take a question from the floor if there is one. And of course, as always, I have one. We have time for maybe one or two uh, gentlemen here. Can we have the excitingly um, square uh, microphone up here, please? It's going to be thrown to you, sir, in a new innovation. I apologize. What can I say? It's coming from over there, and the deal is we catch the microphone. <laughs> she caught the microphone. Yeah. We're That's speaking to that? yeah. Brilliant. Uh, my name is Didier Guerin from Media Convergence Asia Pacific. Uh, I think that one of the best quotes I've heard in this industry comes from, from Henry Luce, who said, we are in a business where the asset lived at night with the elevator, and I think this hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're talking about change of culture. Um, my question is, Time Inc. has always been known as a very American company with very American culture. You have an international company as well. How are you going to translate your enthusiasm and your change of culture to the uh, interna international products that you have around the world? Time Inc. has always been a U.S.-based publisher, and with IPC assets, Time Inc. UK now, we were a domestic UK publisher. We were not an international publisher. Uh, we have just hired Steve Marcopoto, who's working with us here as our international president. He's going to be working, at, working with us on a plan. You know, when I came back, I realized that we had tremendous opportunities internationally, but for the first two years, I had to take the company public. I had to raise $4 billion. I had to focus on the domestic turnaround or the UK turnaround. And we're working with Steve right now and his team on working at a developing a plan for looking at how we expand our opportunities around the world because there are lots of opportunities there. So that is in 2016, and you'll see a lot more of international growth from us in that period, thanks to Steve and his team's efforts. Great. We might just take one more if there is one. Uh, uh, gentlemen here, do raise your hand and I will catch sight of you. You ready for the um, embarrassing catching business? Go for it. A little bit closer. Great speech, by the way. Um, when you came in and you made this transformation, did you have to change the actual content, the stories, or was it more just about the structure around it? Or was the actual content a problem as well? Actually, uh, two things. Uh, our, on our content side, I think our journalism has never been stronger. In fact, we continue to break uh, news, we continue to cover important events, but we have changed the content of our websites. In the past, what we used to do is take our magazine content and produce it online. So we take, example, Bruce Jenner. When Bruce Jenner converted to, Kayla, uh, to Caitlin, uh, People Magazine broke that story. When People Magazine said it was true, that became the news. Prior to that, it was the rumor. When People Magazine said it was true, it was true then. In the past, we did the five, six-page story in People Magazine. That would have been pushed online. 
Now we did 50 stories online from that story, breaking it up into small segments. Because on your mobile device, on your iPad, you don't want to engage in a six-page story online. So the traffic of People Magazine is now back to number one because we're taking the long-form stories that we cover so well in our magazines and breaking them out into shareable moments that people want to have online, and that is the change in the content strategy for the digital distribution and for mobile distribution. They're just different devices. And yet in the past, what did the magazine industry do? When the iPad came out, what did we do? Rather than grabbing that wonderful technology, we reproduced our magazines online in PDF versions. We took that device, which was incredible, like the car, and we put the horse in front of the car so the horse wouldn't have to pull so much. The reality is that it's a different device, and you've got to create your content for devices. So what we're seeing is our magazines are still long-form print journalism. Mobile is a different experience, more, more video from us, and online a lot more shorter stories, shareable stories that people are looking for.